Uh, 30 years ago, I scraped up enough money and uh, took a big enough loan to buy an Apple IIe computer. Uh, over the weekend, I caught up with Steve Wozniak, the man who actually produced and invented that computer, the co-founder of Apple. Uh, he took us through his journey with Apple, his relationship with Steve Jobs. It's fascinating insights. Let's take a look. Well, we're talking today to the co-founder of Apple Computer, the most valuable company in the world, Steve Wozniak. Um, Steve, it's, it's uh, or was rather, I think everyone calls you was, don't they? Yeah. It's oh yes, boss or Steve, I don't care. It's been a it's, it's really funny because everybody with the last name Wozniak, at least in the United States, winds up with the nickname Woz. So everywhere I go, I'll hear some other people are Wazes around. <laughs> well, it, and it stuck from uh, uh, being a young man. But take us through what was it about Homestead High, where you went to school. Uh, we're going to talk uh -huh. about lots of other big important things, but into your background, Homestead High, where you went to school, Steve Jobs went to school, uh, it, you were Matter the fact, star. seven mm -hmm. of the first ten people in Apple, um, responsible for Apple, went to Homestead High School. But that's because, that's just an example that when you're young, you tend to start things and you call friends to help you. You know, you aren't professional enough yet to hire other people from outsiders and interview and all that. Um, so, I don't, Homestead was a new high school. It was in a place that had a reputation for good schooling. To this day, I mean, two of the top 25 schools in the country for public, public high schools for um, SAT scores are in Cupertino. Cupertino's had that reputation. And it was a brand new school. I wouldn't say it was that much different than any other school. Any other school might have had the same books, the same teacher quality. We had an incredible electronics teacher. You know, and everybody thinks to whatever high school they went to, oh, they remember a couple of the teachers were so unbelievably incredible. But this one was an electronics teacher and uh, influenced both me and Steve Jobs and many of the other people in the early start of Apple. What made him so good? He was independent. He didn't necessarily just follow a procedure. Give me a book and I'll teach the book. He wrote his own course. He thought out what we needed and wrote every day examples, experiments, me methodology. Here's how this works. And he worked with us so closely, he got industry to contribute parts to the class. He got the school district to contribute low-cost kits that as the students learned, they would build the first year. They built one thing. Second year, they built another. By the year I got there, the third year of the school, we had a full set of test equipment. You know, we were like, we had a better lab than the local colleges. But he really taught it off the, the skin of his pants. And he could smile. He could tell jokes. He understood people as being people. I don't know why. And he got to us so well. Um, we did more actual slide rule calculations in that class than you did in physics or chemistry. And yet it was considered a vocational course. So it had a lot of lower type students. Not only a few of us were the high academic ones. Mm -hmm. You were five years older than the late Steve Jobs. Uh, four, yeah, actually, I think. Was it four? Uh -huh. close, four is close. And uh, at, at that stage of one's life, that's a big gap, and yet you became friends. Um, I turns out that as I grew up, I was shy, I was an electronics geek, and I tended to pick friends that were not in my age, because they were off socializing, boy, girl stuff, parties, stuff I could not do, and I was sort of an outsider, so I used to go down to lower level people and impress them. I knew my electronics knowledge and there were a lot of them interested in electronics so they were generally younger anyway. And, um, and I didn't care about an age. He could have, Steve Jobs could have been older when I met him. We had similar interests and he was a big pusher to do things and he spotted me as being a great technologist. So we actually had um, um, endeavors that we did together over and over and over for five years leading up to the start of Apple. Start of Apple was just saying, let's, let's call ourselves a company because we've really been one for five years. And you were together for how long after that? Well, uh, all until it's his death. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, we were never, we were never um, disfriendly or anything like that. We did go in different directions because of personal philosophies in life. I wanted to avoid big running companies. I didn't want to turn power and wealth into more of it. I just wanted to do my engineering that I was so superb at. Steve wanted to find his way to be the head of a company. And he really didn't find it in all the time until he left Apple. It wasn't until he returned that he really had the abilities to um, uh, make those decisions without, without monitoring, without other people mentoring, counseling, looking over him. Were you close enough to still spend time with his family now, post his, his death? No. No, uh, no. we were living in different cities, we, even in the company we hadn't seen each other in a long time. I picked friends that are more like me and uh, fun loving, new starting new companies and Steve was more the businessman making the big thing out of the big company.
Were so, you, were you know. surprised when he came back to Apple? Because at, the, at, at that point in time, um, you'd already left before he, went, before he returned. I was not surprised because, A, he had proven himself as a um, full-fledged company CEO with Pixar, for example. Um, and next to develop a fine computer, he knew how to run a computer company, even though he hadn't had a success with it. Um, sold to Apple, he understood the bits and pieces of technology that were needed and the foundation that the company needed. It was obvious from day one. I mean, that was one of the proud, happiest days of my life that he came back because I felt like the original Apple culture. Everybody in the company loving where they worked and loving the company for the right reasons was back. No, and I wasn't surprised at all. Um, he sort of took it on cautiously, like interim CEO, and I was kind of like everybody, judging him for a while, you know. And luckily, good things came out of it. Mm. And next computer, just to just to digress a little, I spoke to Tim Berners-Lee uh, in uh, in Davos and asked him, is it true that he would not have been able to do what he did with the internet if it weren't for next computer? And he said, absolutely. That computer was so far ahead of anything else at the time. Um, yeah, that's, it sounds fair to me, although actually any Unix machine was really pretty much at that level. Um, the Macintosh, unfortunately, was one computer that had a lot of difficulties doing that kind of stuff because from the day one, the core of the machine had not been designed for networks. Steve didn't understand networks. He wasn't technical. It hadn't been designed for multiple tasks running at the same time. All the things that modern, you know, languages like Linux and, um, and Unix and, and you know our operating system were based on. The, the Macintosh was the weakest of them all for a lot of those things. However, it was obvious that every single machine could get on and use the internet for the purposes that Tim Berners-Lee was after, which was uh, getting some paid by uh, um, DARPA in the United States to develop this, this web browser, a technique where people could share files from the many computers. And one of the problems that Tim had was his computer understood its programs for word processors. If you had a document that you wanted to read on a next computer, it would play on a next computer. It wouldn't play on a Windows machine. It wouldn't play on a Macintosh. How do you, so he was right at the center of understanding why we needed a method to share our data, our written data, in a way that every machine can read. Well, you've become uh, very famous around the world now because, uh, not least because of the, the biography, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, which is a bestseller, but also this movie that came out with Ashton uh, Kutcher. You are quoted as saying that the movie wasn't really that good. Um, that's right. Um, I, I, I watched um, a TV show called Pirates of Silicon Valley. Wow, I was excited. I was cheering. Man, that was so, so well presented. And this movie just set let me thinking. I felt bored. I didn't feel high energy. Wow, that's exciting. I didn't feel like, you know, there were, there were um, crises and, and there were resolutions, um, conflicts. You know, I didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't even see the brilliance of Steve Jobs. I didn't see him coming out a couple times. They had him reading parts of our ads and stuff, and that was the best part of the movie to me, mm -hmm. but they were very short and weak. They didn't have him arguing with other people over why something should be a certain way. I wanted to see that brilliance. I wanted to see what we love about Steve Jobs, and even um, things that we hate about Steve Jobs, they downplayed a little. Some of that was in there. So I walked out feeling like I'd had a meal, but I was still hungry. Mm -hmm. I wanted more. I missed the guts of it. It wasn't there. That's, but that's just me. You don't have to feel the same way I did. Um, I also felt that there were, it extended a lot of myths about Steve Jobs being a lot more superior in the earlier days than he was. He was just a young kid. As you, as you both were at that time, uh, starting funding up the company, tell us that story. How did you, what mm -hmm. did you do to get it going, to get the well, cash together? First of all, we had an incredible product. This was going to be the only successful product of Apple Computer for the first 10 years. It was the Apple II computer. I had conceived it, I thought of it, I had my reasons, I wanted to affect society, and I had designed and built it, and then Steve Jobs came and saw it. And he said, we should, we should this one, we should, we should start a company. My engineer friends at Hewlett Packard said this is the best product they'd ever seen. So it wasn't just Steve Jobs, and it was anybody who saw this thought it was the best thing they'd ever seen. Mike Markle, who became our funder, took me into the Intel staff meeting. Here I am, this 25-year-old shy guy, in a staff meeting, typing hexadecimal data into a machine and <coughs> making colors on a TV screen. So uh, it was real obvious, but to seek the money, um, that was Steve Jobs' role because he was always the businessman. That's why we were such a good partnership. I had these technical abilities to see the world way ahead of everyone else and design things nobody had thought of and violate all the rules in textbooks to get it done. 
And Steve always wanted to find sales. And later on, and, and he didn't necessarily have even social reasons. The very first Apple One I wanted to give so badly to a teacher, and he wouldn't go for it. So he made me buy it. So I had to buy it to give it to her. <laughs> uh, from the, I bought it from the two of us. But um, he didn't at first have the social goals, but he became the voice of the company. He became the one that was in the press's eye, and that was equally important. You can't take a great product and make it successful without good marketing. And Steve Jobs just learned. He at first was taught by Mike Markula. The looks of a product are very important. How you present your company image is very important. He was taught the rules of marketing. You have to understand the clients, build the machines exactly where they are. Your company has to follow the market. And Steve would speak these words out so eloquently. He was a great speaker. I would have been way too shy. I would have never been able to, to um, you know, explain to the world, here's why you should have computers in your home. Here's why they are good for society and good for the world. And the funny thing is, we were actually wrong. <laughs> but they were really poor, weak little machines at the beginning. But then all of a sudden, miracles happened. And the miracle was programs and software that made this machine valuable, made it so worthwhile we were going to be a huge successful business. And a new category of business had been started forever. But Steve, so Steve and I were just a lucky, lucky partnership. Lucky also to be in Silicon Valley at that time? You know, at that time, there was not so much entrepreneurship, young people thinking, what am I going to do to start my own company? Mostly it was existing companies in Silicon Valley, building electronics, building silicon chips. Engineers would spin off, and they would start their own company doing roughly the same thing. Spin-offs, spin-offs, spin-offs was the, the, the mode of the day. But we had a capital system that understood that a lot of these just add success to this growing electronics market. Electronics market was, was always growing because of Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. You could absolutely every year have a product for the same price that did more than the year before, more than the year before, and the rough number is every 18 months it could do twice as much. So over a lifetime that winds up being a billion times more than when we started. So, of course, electronics was going to grow, and Silicon Valley had a critical mass. We had all the elements from the legal people that were used to, used to the business and how to write different contracts. We had other companies around that you could talk to and become partners with. We didn't have an internet in those days, so you kind of had to be local. So it was a huge advantage to be in Silicon Valley, but now, nowadays that's not so true. Mm -hmm. was we, we're going to go broader in, uh, in the second half of our segment, but before we leave the early days of Apple, Ron Wayne, uh, the man who convinced you apparently, according to legend, according to, to what I've written, to join Steve Jobs, although you weren't too keen in the initial stages, he was the guy who had 10% of Apple Computer and then gave it away or sold it? No, Unluckiest wait, man no, no, alive. No. Steve and I were on our own. We had built oh. and sold my projects for five years. We are, we're starting this company with the Apple One computer. It's actually the fifth time one of my projects, Steve, was going to turn into money. And the idea was not even to build the whole computer at first. You know what? You do with what you have. We didn't have any bank accounts. We had no money. We had no business experience. We had no rich relatives. So what we were going to do was put a few hundred dollars each in to make a part of a computer for $20 and sell it for 40 One part of a computer, okay, that would help other people build my computer. And Ron Wayne, St Steve had met Ron Wayne at Atari and kind of liked him because Ron Wayne had business experience and Steve was seeking in his life for anybody that could train him on ways to go. Ron Wayne had been through stock deals and companies that made it and companies that failed. And, and he, he was, he was uh, turned out he was arch conservative reading all these little these brochures about, you know, you should have all your money in gold. But to us young guys, <laughs> that sounded like brilliance. He's so brilliant. He really sees the world and other people don't. So um, uh, Steve invited me over to meet him, and, and we both, or Steve and I both agreed to give him 10%. Because then if Steve and I ever had a dispute, we could trust Ron Wayne with his logical thinking to, you know, resolve the dispute. And so I, it wasn't like I, I, Ron Wayne's idea. If it was Ron Wayne's idea, I was never told that, and I haven't read Steve's book. <laughs> and what happened to his 10%? Well, what happened was after a short time, way too short a time, uh, because he was participating, he drew a great etching that became Newton under the apple tree that became uh, the cover of our um, uh, Apple One manual. He wrote a legal, he sat down to typewriter and wrote a legal document assigning all the rights and this and that and all the, lo the lawyer talk that I can't do. He just wrote it out of his head. This guy, and he was brilliant about everything in so many ways. He was so versatile, so multi-talented. And I was shocked when Steve told me that Ron decided he was going to sell out for a few hundred dollars. 
and and I mean, we didn't really see. This was Apple One days. We didn't really see um, the the unbelievable future we were going to have with this new Apple II. Although we had the Apple II built before we even shipped an Apple One, Ron Wayne had seen it. I guess he just had doubts. You know what? There were a lot of good doubts. The big computer companies of the day doubted it would be more than a little dinky hobbyist movement. People that like to build parts and solder them together themselves, and. They were right. When we came out with these computers, they really couldn't do much to pay for themselves. They were an interesting type of electronic toy. People were hearing the word computer. It was, it was like a new fad to, wow, maybe we could get a computer in our home. But they really didn't do much until the spreadsheet program came along and made them more valuable than mainframes for certain other applications. We're here in Johannesburg with Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computer. Uh, was, it's been uh, interesting going over the history, but perhaps we could bring up to date now with, with what you're doing with your life. Uh, I, I heard a venture capitalist tell me that Silicon Valley is seeing more innovation today than ever before. Would, do, do you think that's right, given uh, the, the, the road that you've traveled? I think it's right. I think the whole world has seen more innovation just based on everywhere I go in the world. I hear people talking more and more ideas they want to turn into companies, into products. Now, a lot of them are apps for smartphones and they aren't making a lot of money, but you know what? That's a phase you go through in your life. I developed a lot of things in my life that had value, but they just weren't quite enough to be big money for a company, you know, and you hit a home run someday. But that's the, that's the path you go on. I'm seeing a lot of that kind of innovation. Um, Do people come to you? Do they ask you? for advice, for suggestions on inventions, innovations? Young people do very often. They ask me for advice about their invention. Is it good or how to think of it? How should they market it? How do they start a company? Where do they go? And I just go back. I think of my own successes and I try to go back and Apple successes and successes that were close to me and failures. And I try to advise them as best I can, you know, give them some little advice in life. And it, it would surprise you how many emails I get back later in life. Oh my gosh, I started this company. I did this and that. And I'm so grateful to you. And you really steered me on the right direction. And I'm very grateful. It's like a teacher having one of their children grow up and, and say, I got to thank you for what I got. And uh, it's very endearing. So I, I try to spend time with young people. I try to answer their email. The trouble is you can also, I'm only one person mm -hmm. and there's a million of them. <laughs> you mentioned Apple. Uh, your, your wife until recently did work at Apple. So you kept close to the company? Um, Although I, you didn't work there for many years. Yeah. Obviously, I will love Apple more than any company in the world forever. Um, I love the products. I love using them. I love people that, that use, use Apple products. Um, but I'm still objective enough to look at other competition and to see what they've done that's good or what they've done that's bad. Um, I try not to, not to complain about bad things. I try to only spot things, wow, I like this. Somebody thought of something new and clever. Now, my wife was also an educator. She was an educator and worked for Apple Education for 19 years or something like that. And education was my second goal in life. In fact, I went and I taught elementary school and middle school for eight years, secretly, no press, because I just wanted to have effect on young people you know, that way. So, so I'm really, I, I found, uh, I'm so lucky. My wife, we have similar world views. I recommend to everybody who doesn't know what a real marriage can be to, uh, to look at mine. You know, similar values, similar um, personalities, similar goals, similar looks at the world. We love all the same things. We love doing things together. She even likes my corny jokes. <laughs> similar values, uh, one of which uh, is, is uh, legendary that you were taught by your father never to lie and extreme honesty has, uh, has been a, a value of yours but perhaps not so for your partner when you started Apple. <laughs> um, it's funny, I just uh, thought when my head, yeah, my mother also said to be funny and be a comedian. And a comedian, everything they tell has to be a lie. So a joke <laughs> is a lie. But um, yeah, that's true. Um, to be out you know, my partner, though, would say, no, 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 he always, always told the truth. But it was like executive style. You can tell when a question is answered, when people want to know something and they're being totally misled and not even told, sorry, we can't tell you. That's more honest. Um, I think Steve was, was actually fairly honest, usually. I don't, I don't remember him. There were a few cases, maybe, where people will say, tell me, friends will tell me, he promised me stock for this, and he didn't give it to them. And... Um, I have a funny feeling it's just because they didn't realize that Steve isn't all powerful. He works for a public company and a public company has owners and the board can only represent their owners and to give somebody some stock that you didn't have a written agreement 
is sometimes difficult to do. It's hard, harder to keep your word. I was taught by my dad, a handshake and your own word is much more important than any legal document and signed thing. Did you keep stock in Apple? Yes. Yeah, but you know what? I'm not a stock trader. So, um, so basically, the only stocks I have right now, my wife and I, are Apple and Fusion IO, another company I'm with. Mm -hmm. That's it. We don't do all this day trading and watch. I, don't, I have never once used Apple's iPhone stock app to look at the price because I determined early in my life I didn't want to be one of these people that are saying, this is up, this is down every day. And their whole life is stressful. And it's not, and it leads to a lot of unhappiness. Why do you want to have frowns in your life? My formula is happiness equals smiles minus frowns. H equals S minus F. The uh, people who are running Apple today, do they get your vote of confidence? They do, but um, it's in a trial period. Uh, I, I think I'm going to wait a little bit longer. But, you know, I figured that after Steve Jobs' death, two years is probably the right time frame to start seeing the, the new Apple, to see their own personalities and their own direction of the company. Um, Tim Cook, largely at the, at the head. And I'm still kind of waiting. Um, the products, though, are excellent. You know what? The first thing is, bottom line, okay, a company like BlackBerry saw the iPhone coming, and they saw maybe this is a whole different future, but we've got our sales, and we, there's nothing's going to interfere with it this year, next year, the year after that. And the trouble is, the fourth or fifth year, they started seeing their, their products become in disfavor, and it was kind of late to start trying to get into the game of this kind of machine with a total screen and not a hard keyboard. Um, you know, so sometimes you don't necessarily see, you can, you can hold your company in sales and your company value very high, and yet, the, mm -hmm. the, yet something's, something's getting in disfavor. You don't want to be in that position. Apple really gets, has made its way to the top by having top quality, maintaining it, and coming up with new outstanding products that are so different, the whole world says, this is the way I want to go. Even though there's similar products that do similar things, Apple did it right. And that's so, so I'm, but you know what, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't have that top new product that's a whole new category of life every single year. So that's why I say wait a while. The products mm -hmm. that are coming out were pretty much in the pipeline even when Steve Jobs was alive. So it takes a while to really see the newcomer. When Steve joined the company, the first products that were coming out had been in the pipeline for a long time. You know, he could only put his magical final touch on it. Mm. There are some young kids in Kenya in the silicon savannah, as we call it on our continent, watching this and saying, how do I become like the, the two Steves, the jobs Wozniak partnership? Mm -hmm. How would you answer a question? Um, first of all, I don't know that it's, it's very often in one person to do both halves. I was so intense and focused, and even when I slept and dreamed, my head was working out my technical problems. I was so good at doing things better than almost anyone else in the world tricky methods that I taught myself rather than learning in books. But I had a lifetime. I had 15 years before Apple even started of working on project after project after project developing these kind of skills. You do need that. You need a technical person with you. You need some clever problem solver who thinks of things other people wouldn't think of in clever ways. For example, I had a bathroom in a hotel once and there's a bathroom door you know, to the bathroom and there's a door to the shower. So they made one door on a, on a pivot, so the one door was either the bathroom door or the shower door. Ah, part savings, cost savings, that was the way I used to think about everything. How do you get the most out of things? So find an excellent technical person to help you think out what your company should do, what you should do in life. And secondly, you know what, first of all, get a job, get an income. Get an income, get stability in your life. Okay, you go to work for eight hours a day, come home. You're young, you've got the mental energy, you've got the physical energy, don't party your life away. Work on your own little projects on the side. Spend your own time working on something you believe in. Build something that you can just show to people and they're impressed, and that has value. You might not get any money for it yet. You build something next time, the next time you build something, when you're young, you start out building a project, you build something a little better, maybe it's a program, and it works a little better and it catches a few more eyes. And every time you build on what you already knew and your, your, enter, your abilities to great, create great things happen. When you hit the home run and you have, a, you have something that, whoa, a lot of people would even be willing to spend money on this. This is something we could possibly raise money for. A lot of people want this. Um, then you'll know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your so, eyes are still shining. Your eye, uh, you're turning 64 this year. 
and yet your eyes are shining. What makes, what keeps <laughs> well, you getting up every morning? <laughs> your last question, actually. All the young people that are uh, excited about life and what they, you know, and what they want to do and they want to include technology, that keeps me going. Memories of my own life, you know, just great things I did and my reasons for it. I am so, so happy that I made a lot of the choices I made. Um, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm also just happy. You know what, I had the formula to happiness in my life sp um, spark in my eye with or without Apple. Didn't mm. even matter. Mm. No, I just, I just had ways of living and ways of life. And the way of life that you lead now, you travel a lot, you meet a lot of people, doesn't it get a bit much too much sometimes? Um, For a guy who's yes. supposed to be shy. Not only shy, but I also did, came to where I did not like travel so much. I did not use my passport for 10 years. Um, except one trip to some place like South Africa. Um, I, I did not use my passport for 10 years, and my last kid finally graduated from high school. So I'm home in a big house all alone, no wife at the time. And then I start saying yes to a lot of things. I wrote a book, I started a company with some Apple executives, and I um, started, I had a friend traveling the world. And it impressed me, a hacker friend, Kevin Mitnick, he would call me from Moscow, from Colombia. And I, I said, wow, I'm kind of jealous. And he said, my speech agent could probably get you speeches. I said, well, okay, tell her to go ahead. So all of a sudden, ever since then, I've been flooded with lots of speaking opportunities, and I've come to love it. Because if I hated it, it's real easy to just say no. But no, I love meeting different kinds of people in different categories of life that are not necessarily technicians. They're not engineers like myself building technical companies. They might be building chairs. They might be carpenters. They might be have beauty salons. They might be jewelers. They might be insurance executives. <coughs> so I love getting to meet all these people in life. And I like to share my stories because I love them so much. Stay hungry, stay curious. <laughs> stay young, stay hungry. Um, <coughs> Yeah, well, I, believe, I actually had a philosophy all my life, and it went back to things teachers said in high school and college that made me think, I want to stay young. We have good minds. We have a lot of fun. We have a great life. We can think out great thoughts, and you don't have to give that up. You don't have to give up the exciting world and the, the world of new inventions, the world of creating things. You don't have to give that up when you become an adult. Now you have to become, I order things and I run things. I didn't want to become that kind of person. And that was one of the keys to my own happiness. Steve Wozniak, it's been such a privilege. Thank you for being on CNBC Africa. Oh, today. my pleasure. Thank you.